Good morning. We, we do want to welcome you to Trinity Evangelical. We do want to, there we go, we do want to welcome you to Trinity Evangelical. When we make a splash, we make a splash, don't we? And especially if you're a guest with us today, a special welcome to you as well. Uh, we do invite you to take the tear out part of the bulletin. If you are a guest, fill it out, drop in the offering plate. And uh, that helps us get to know you a little bit better. Prayer requests. Also, make sure you fill out anything at all that's on your heart that you'd like us to join you in prayer. Fill out that tear out part, drop it in the offering plate, hand it to one of the people you see on staff or bring them up and lay it on the altar. We'll get them. Get them to us so we can pray with you for the things that are on your heart. I'm Steve. I'm Alec. We're blessed to be on staff here at Trinity. Alec, we've got some ministry opportunities that we want to share with them today. Yes, so um, as you all know, we've been doing uh, Operation Christmas Child, and so those boxes are going to be due at the end of the third service today. All right, and we're going to be doing Believer's Baptisms next Sunday, right here during each one of our services. So if you have signed up or if you are interested in being baptized, there's a baptism class today during 1115 service right across the hallway in 113, need to make sure that you're there. And so the Thanksgiving lunch, uh, Thanksgiving day at, at noon, is it, Steve? It's at noon. Um, if you want to be a part of that in any way, um, just the sign-ups are out at the featured ministries table. If you want to sign up to bring some things or if you want to serve or if you just want to come and have dinner with us, um, you can sign up for that on the featured ministry table. That's awesome. And teenagers. Teenage, we're going to have a teenager luncheon coming up on the 30th of November at 1130. There is a sign-up sheet out on the featured ministry table for that as well. Make sure that you take time to sign up so we know how many people are going to be there. As always, there's a lot of things going on. Make sure you take time to check, read your bulletin, check the featured ministry table to see how God would plug you in uh, to, the, to the services that he does through this church. Alec, today is a special day to honor some special people in our congregation, isn't it? Today being Veterans Day, we are so thankful that we live in a country where we can come and worship freely on Sunday mornings, and in large part, to those of you who have served in our military. So at this time, we would like, if you are a veteran, we would like for you to stand so we can recognize you at this time. Thank you so much. A thank you from our mouth. A, a pin. There are pins back as you leave by the main entrance. Please make sure, veterans, you pick one of those up. Those are very, very small tokens, ways for us to say thank you for all that you have done. We appreciate that so much. And you will be in our prayers today and always thanking you for your service. With that, we're going, I'm going to invite you to stand and greet one another and then remain standing for our opening hymn. Oh. 
call to prayer. Father God, you are an awesome, awesome God. And Father, we do come to you and give thanks with grateful hearts. With grateful hearts. For all that you have given to us. Father, on this Veterans Day, we come to you with grateful hearts. And thank you for those men and women who are willing to give up their time, to give up a time of their lives. Father, willing to give up their lives for the freedom that we enjoy today. Father, with grateful hearts, we say thank you for each and every one of them and ask you to bless them in a special way today. 
Father, it is with grateful hearts that we come to you and we thank you for the blessings that you have given each of us in our lives. Father, thank you for the harvest that is coming in and has come in. Father, thank you for the opportunities that you give us to share your love. Father, thank you for Todd being willing to come and speak this week to our community. Father, thank you for the opportunities to be your light that shines into this world. Father, we come to you today with grateful hearts and thank you for the people that you have put in our lives. Father, we thank you for family. We thank you for friends. Father, we thank you for our enemies. Father, we thank you that you have taught us how to love all people, to love our neighbor as ourself. Father, we thank you for those people that you have put in our lives who are in need of special prayer. And we thank you for the opportunity to come before you and lift them up to you. Those who are in need of physical healing, those who are in need of emotional healing, those who are in need of financial healing, whatever their need is, Father, we come before you and we give them to you. Father, we come to you and we thank you that you are a God who loves us unconditionally. We, we come to you and thank you for the opportunity to love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And Father, we come to you today and we thank you for your son. We thank you for your willingness, Father, to give up your son and send him to earth. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your willingness to leave your throne in heaven, to come and walk this earth as a man, to be an example to us of how to live a perfect life. But be willing to sacrifice all of that, to lay down your life for my sins, to go to the cross, to die an earthly death, but not to stay in that tomb, but to be raised, to conquer death, to show us all that it is through a relationship with you that we can spend eternity in heaven. Father, today we just come with grateful hearts to say thank you. And so, Father, it is out of the love and the respect that we have for Jesus that we lift up to you the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to continue in worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you are a guest with us today, we do want to say thank you so much again. Your gift to us today is being here to worship with us, and we really appreciate that. So while Noah blesses us with special music, the ushers will take up the offering.
Let us pray. And so, God, we are mindful on this 11th day of this 11th month of our desire to see all wars end. Lord, we thank you for those who would take their place to serve us and for all who give themselves even today in far-off lands. But, Lord, we're mindful that service does a work in our hearts to bring us closer together. And so help us as a people who can sometimes live in comfort and abundance hear your call to sacrifice and service. Not only that we might build your kingdom, but that we might know the joy of serving together. And so, Lord, use these gifts and all who gave them. Lord, call us to service to your kingdom in such a way that you might bind your church together, that we might know the fellowship of the saints and, Lord, the the work of your Holy Spirit. So use these gifts. Give us wisdom in how we put them to work in our church, that it all might be for your glory. For we thank you for every good gift and pray it all in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. amen. I invite you to remain standing as we're going to sing a song for uh, a prayer for our country on this Veterans Day. As we prepare to sing, I'm going to invite the kids who would like to go out to Lambs this morning to do so. If there are kids who would like to head out this morning, you're dismissed. Excited to get out there today, we can tell. That's awesome. They're going to take the long way. You can go either way. And uh, while uh, they head out, we're going to sing God Bless America. Appreciate it. Wow, what a great morning. Um, you know, we've been doing lead for God's sake. This is going to be the last week. And um, I know you all have memorized everything that's happened from the beginning. The first week was on the leadership secret of prayer. Then it was on position. Then it was on people. And then last week it was on priorities. But the memory verse that Pastor Jim has been telling us all, all, all month is, is what? Go ahead, you can speak it loud. Today's about passion, so you can be bold about it. What's, what's the memory verse? Oh, that was good. It wasn't unified, but it was good. I heard it in all different places. That was awesome, okay? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And so as we go into passion today, the first thing we're going to do is we've got a testimony by uh, Victor Foss, who was in our Lead for God's Sake men's group this, this summer. So he's going to come up and share a little bit of testimony. I guarantee it's going to have some passion to it. So Victor, if you want to come over, come on up right now and share with us, that would be awesome. So give Victor a big hand today. You guys hear me now? A little bit better? Okay. So uh, you guys are going to have to excuse me here. I got a, a shared notebook here. Uh, I share this with my two children who are four and two. Um, so I got some notes that I'm, I might be reading off of. If you hear me kind of going off, it might sound like I'm talking in tongues. Maybe uh, it's probably not that. It's probably uh, some scribbles that uh, my four-year-old uh, left me for notes. So, <laughs> um, But like, like Shane said, uh, I'm here because, you know, we went through the Lead for God's Sake group together uh, over the summer. Uh, really had some, some great um, growth in it, I would say, at least from my standpoint. Uh, this kind of growth is not something that comes, I think, when we, uh, when we just kind of go through life in a, in a lukewarm way, as Shane kind of uh, uh, always uses uh, that phrase. Um, this is the kind of growth that comes from really... Like, getting meaningful, getting deep with each other, and that's not something that, at least for a group of guys, isn't real common. Um, so it's been a real blessing for me to go through that group, uh, and I'm going to share a little bit about what that did for me, um, and, and it's actually continuing to do for me. So uh, I work a swing shift, so uh, I'm basically, I'm, I'm able to make it every other week, but uh, the last uh, off cycle I had, I had a class, so um, anyways, I was here, though, uh, when Daryl Watson came up and gave his testimony, um, which was pretty cool to hear. Um, and, you know, when, when Daryl was up here, I felt like, you know, he, he spoke to me. Um, well, he, he literally spoke to me. I was sitting over there, and he looked over at me, and he says, Victor, I love you. <laughs> so he literally spoke to me there. And, and I just want to say, I think Daryl might be upstairs I love you too, brother. Um, in fact, uh, through the group uh, that we spent over the summer, um, I mean, we met, met once a week, uh, but I'll tell you, I, I grew a, a love for each one of these uh, men as we went through it. And I want to tell you guys today um, that I'm working on my heart right now to love every single person in this room. And that's kind of a, you know, you could take that two different ways, right? Um, and you say, oh yeah, you know, we love each other. You're like, that's, that's cool, right? You know, we're Christians. Um, but when we really think about the word love, like love is a commitment. Um, so I think it's a little bit more than just saying, hey, you know, I love this congregation. I love the people in this room. I love the people in this community. I love the people on this earth. I love my neighbor. It's more than just saying it, right? So I'm really working on my heart here um, to try to understand that a little bit better. Uh, I mean, we're called, we're called to love, right? Uh, it's one of the biggest things I get um, from the teachings of Jesus is that we're called to love. And uh, why is that? You know, it's not just because he tells us to love. It's because he shows us to love. Uh, the kind of love he has for us is something that I think we could spend our whole lives trying to interpret and still never really grasp the whole uh, the whole boundaries of it, if there are even boundaries, right? Um, I can tell you from my experience, you know, I've had valleys and, and, and mountains, okay? Um, I don't know if any of you have had valleys. Has anyone had a valley? Yeah? Did God's love for you ever change? No. And I'm telling you, that aspect that God's love never changes is so special to me that when we're in our lowest spots, I mean, some of us can go real low, right? I know personally I can, I can, speak, uh, I can speak to my lows, and, and I look at them personally like, man, I've, I've hit some lows. But God loved me there. He loved me there. He loves me now. And I'm telling you, the way he shows that love is just inspiring. 
So he doesn't just tell us, he doesn't call us to love each other. He shows us how to do it. And I'm telling you that, that even, if you're, even if you're in a dark place now, who, you, know, you don't have to come out right and tell us all what's going on with, with, with your life right now, but maybe you're dealing with some financial difficulties, maybe you're dealing with uh, uh, you know, some, some trouble with, with your marriage, maybe you're dealing with some trouble with your kids, um, whatever it is, if you're dealing with some hardships, don't think that God's love isn't for you or that you're not deserving of God's love. There are times, the reason why I say that is there was times where I convinced myself of that. <laughs> what are you doing, Victor? You've done this and you've just, you've just broken God's heart. You don't deserve God's love. And I can tell you that's happened years ago. <laughs> My mind's played tricks on me as, as recent as a few days ago. You don't deserve God's love for what you do. And that's a lie. God's love is for you. It's unchanging. It's unwavering. And nothing you do can separate you from the choice that you have of accepting it. And that's it. We just have to accept his love. It doesn't sound hard, but we like to make it hard sometimes. That's all we have to do is just accept it. And so Daryl was, was speaking to me. All right? So not just literally he was you know, pointing me out and saying, hey, I love you, brother. But he was speaking to me. When he came up here, um, I, he confessed, at least in uh, the 10 o'clock service, that uh, uh, this was not an easy thing for him to do. He came right out front with that and said, this, this is probably one of my bigger fears, is to get up in public speak. And I thought, wow, man. You know, that's, that right there was testimony to just following in faith for leading for God's sake. He came up here, despite what every nerve in his body was probably telling him to do, and he still gave a testimony. And he confessed his fear to all of us. That's a tough thing to do. I'm telling you, as a man, that's a tough thing to do. I have, I have a hard enough time confessing to God, let alone people I know, maybe don't know, people I'm in church with. That's a tough one. And he did that, and I saw almost, and here, here's, here's what was so special to me about this, I saw it get easier. It got easier, and I was honed in on what he was saying. And I think a big part of that is making that confession. I think there's some biblical truth to confession. So not only with God, but like I said, God calls us to love him, but to love each other as well. And so part of that is confession to each other, not just God. We're confessing some of the stuff that you struggle with with each other. And that's one of, this thing, one of the things that... Uh, you know, I really grew in with this small group over the summer was opening up to other people. I mean, prior to this, I probably, you know, opened up to my wife once in a while, sometimes my brother. Um, but for the most part, I, I kind of try to keep that stuff between me and God. Um, but I really learned it's, it's okay. It's okay to talk to each other. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what a, a, a fear I have, okay? Um, I'm gonna confess to you, I have a fear of, of failing, of messing up, uh, of just not getting it right. So coming up here and speaking to you guys today, uh, you know, I had a lot of um, angst in the aspect that, you know, I really want God to use me in whatever way he's calling me to be used and I don't want to screw that up. So please, I'm going to ask up front right now for your pardon, for your forgiveness, if I kind of screw this up and, like I said, start reading some of the notes my daughter left me. Forgive me. But I'll tell you, those two things, those primary commandments that Jesus gave us, love, love God 
with everything you have, everything you have, is so important. I mean, he says this is, this is number one. You have to love the Lord your God with everything you ha- have. Your heart, your mind, your body, your soul, your strength, everything. Love God. And then what's next? What's immediately after that? Second, love your neighbor as you love yourself. As you love yourself. Man, sometimes I think, well, it should have been better than you love yourself. And I started to think how much I really love myself. Like, man, you know, I'd do just about anything to keep myself alive. You know? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I joined the fire department. All right, that's one little step that I try to take to, hey, maybe I can love my neighbor a little bit in this way that God's blessed me to be able to do. But loving your neighbor is so important. First, though, love God. So where do you start, right? Where do you start? I'll tell you, if you're new, uh, if, if you're new to this whole thing, if you're new to um, having a re- relationship with God, let alone other people. Um, I'll give you an idea of where to start. Um, you know, talk to God. I'll tell you, if, if there's something that's weighing on your heart that you're feeling a, a tug uh, after Shane kind of gets done up here uh, and we get into a, a, a joyful noise towards the end of the service, if you're feeling a tug that, hey, I need to, I need to lay something out with God, it's altar rails should and can be used. It's a great place to start. If you want to have a relationship with God, that's a a perfect place to start. If you're good with God in this moment, and you're absolutely good, hey, we've already hashed it out, we fist bumped, we're good. Um, Fist bumps, you know, something my generation does to say that we're good. Um, Hey, we're good. Okay. Maybe you're not in a small group, maybe you don't have a a group of people that you connect with, that you share with, that you get real with. I mean, we got got real in that small group this summer. We got real with each other. We shared. We didn't just talk about the weather for an hour, okay? It's easy to do living here in Ohio. I could talk to you about the weather right now for a good hour, what, what it's doing. But we got a little deeper than that. And I'm telling you, God's calling you guys, all of us, to get a little deeper than just what the weather is. So if you're not, if you're not doing that right now, and you, you, don't, you don't know where to start, I'm telling you, see one of the staff members. Talk to me if you want afterwards. Um, you know, you, there's always someone here through the week. Get plugged in somehow with like-minded believers, people that you can share with, people you can be real with. It's biblical. There's some good truth to it. All right, let's say, all right, you got that down to you. You're good with God. You've got your fist bump in with God. Uh, You know, you high five with a group of people on a weekly basis. You get real. I'm good, Victor. I don't need none of that. Okay. Doesn't mean you're off the hook. All right. Go be a fisher of men. Don't just settle for where you're at now. We're called to go out and be the body of Christ. We're called to go out and seek others out. So if when we get done with this service today, you walk out in the atrium, you're having a cup of coffee or whatever, and you see someone kind of maybe standing off by themselves, um, and you kind of feel God tell you, hey, someone needs to go talk to him or her. And I'm telling you, from experience, if you sit on that and wait, probably about after seven seconds, you'll have yourself convinced why someone else will take care of that and that you should continue uh, on out the door or on to whatever next thing you have planned out in your day. But I'm telling you, listen to that little tugging that the Holy Spirit's given to you when you see someone that maybe you can uh, reach into their lives and give them a little fist bump. Tell them a little bit about God. Tell them your experience. Give them your testimony. Tell them why it's important to you. Hey, I'm having coffee. 
let me have coffee with somebody. You're not off the hook. Sorry. There's things that we can all do to grow in this. I'm telling you, I've, I've hit different points in my life where I'm like, man, I am so good with God. You know, I get a nice little reality check. Or I get these points like in the summer where I realize, man, there's so much more to be had. So I'm telling you, wherever you're at, whether this is going to be something new to you, whether you need to start um, opening up with God, or whether you need to reach out to other people to just share your life, or you need to hear someone else share their life, whatever it is, I'd really encourage you to lead for God's sake. Thanks, guys. Power that bad boy down so we don't run. No, so thankful for all of you who served, not only in the military, but firefighters and police officers in the medical field that every day sacrifice a little bit of themselves to save lives. And so give, uh, once again, all the veterans who have a passion to serve our country a hand. So I already have these two big lights up there that say slow down, and I'm not even paying any attention to them, just so you know. So if you see the blinking behind you telling me to slow down, I'm not going to. Because they were going to get after it, okay, for the next 15 minutes. And the first thing we have to realize is what Jim's been talking about, the first four Ps lead right into passion. But passion is not what we think it is. Passion is not some shallow excitement. It's basically a conviction. And so today we're going to talk about Peter. But the first thing we have to do is build a base foundation for what leads to passion. So I have to use props because I'm just a prop guy, and that's the way it works. But one of the coolest inventions ever, a true masterpiece. It's a cheese grater, okay? And what you have to understand is some guy wasn't just walking along out in the shed someday, picked that up, and picked it up and said, think I'll grate some cheese. No, somebody thought ahead. Somebody said, you know what? How cool would it be to have little strips of cheese grated up from my nachos to put on my baked potato? And so they designed it. They made a masterpiece and they crafted this for a purpose. And it grates cheese. And see, that's just like our Father in heaven when he created you and me. He looked down and said, you know what? There's a need in the world. And I'm going to craft this person for a specific need to do something that nobody else can do. And he tells us that all throughout scripture. But in Jeremiah, when he talks about Jeremiah, he knew him before he was in the womb. That means, you know what, Jeremiah, I'm forming you for a purpose to go tell Israel that, you know what, the church is doing crummy right now. And I need you to go tell them so they can be fixed. And so this cheese grater is made for a purpose. And boy, don't, it grates cheese, right? You love the cheese grater. The crazy thing, though, I got another prop here, too. This is awesome. Let me see here. Whew. Oh, the apple slicer. Yeah, it's bad too, huh? It's got some great stuff. And so this apple slicer, you know what? It cores this apple. You come right in here and you go, boom. And you got a sliced apple. Oh, just like that. And you can eat that apple. But see, the whole thing about this is this is completely different than this. And what happens in the church and in the world is this says, Man, I wish I could grate cheese. And then, you know what? It falls short because of the law of comparison. But you have to look at what it did to this apple. Two completely different things made for two completely different purposes. And it's just like us. We look at somebody else's gift and we start comparing. And we lose the sense that we have a purpose that nobody else does. And it's so much bigger than just the church. Because with the social feed that we have today, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Instagram, we compare our real lives to somebody's Facebook status. And all of a sudden we lose passion because we forgot our purpose. So today we're gonna go right into Peter. And Peter's one of my favorites. Oh, Peter's one of my favorites because Peter wasn't worried about what everybody else thought. In fact, what you first have to understand is the scripture out of lead for God's seek this week from the Joe the janitor, he's telling coach, whatever you do, whatever you do, meaning whether you're a cheese grater, an apple slicer, or, or a food processor, maybe you're that cool. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord, not for man. In other words, be passionate about it. Many of us know that's Colossians 3.23. But when Peter comes along, he knows he's designed for a purpose because he was a fisherman. He was standing out in the middle of fishing when Jesus came along and said, hey, come follow me. And he dropped everything and he went. But you see what happened with Peter is he had a catalyst. 
His purpose gave him passion. It wasn't the other way. He didn't just wake up and become excited for something. His purpose was Jesus, and Jesus changed his life. Because here's, here's the definition of passion in my humble opinion. It's where purpose and selflessness intersect, and conviction is born. It's where your purpose, what you were meant to do, realizes that I'm not here just for myself. I'm here for others. And then all of a sudden, something deep inside you is born. And all of a sudden, your have-tos become want-tos. And this is where Peter is, okay? Peter's just decided to follow Jesus. All right, and the first thing you have to do to get this passion is Peter had to believe. You know, this law of comparison so many times takes the belief in ourselves and the gifts God's given us and compares it to somebody else so we never even know what we've designed to do. And, and we compare ourselves, well, I'm just designed to get a job, to get a house, to retire. And I live this meaningless sometimes. I feel like, oh, every Monday or whatever, I get up, I go through it again. And I don't really have that passion inside of me. But Peter, we see in Matthew 14, he's just seen Jesus feed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. And Jesus has just went up on the hill. And if you have your Bibles with you, I would love for you to turn there because there's a lot of scripture and I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to paraphrase it. But it's in Matthew 14, verse 25 through 31. And what's happening is Jesus has just went up on the hill to pray and he's to send his disciples out on the lake. But he sent them out in a storm. And he's up there praying for them and he kind of has this concern that I need to be with God. But my disciples are getting ready to go into a storm. But that's kind of crazy because sometimes that's what happens with us. We're in the storm, and, and Jesus gives us some time to go through it so we can learn through it. And they're being buffeted by the waves, and they're out there in the darkness, and they're trying to get across the lake figuring, well, Jesus is going to come around. But that's not what happened, is it? No. For the first time ever, Jesus comes to them walking on the water. He walks across the water to give them assurance, I'm here with you in the darkness. But these are disciples just like us. We're out there, and we see just Jesus coming to us, and oh, the storms are bigger, and so we don't believe it, so we say, oh, it must be a ghost. So they're all thinking it's a ghost. But then it's not. Jesus tells them, take courage. It is I. And then Peter asks the questions. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. And just like Chris said two weeks ago when he was sharing his testimony, Jesus said, come. Whew. Jesus said, come. One word. Jesus said, come, right? And so Peter became passionate in that moment because of his belief. And he got his jumping shoes on. Under armor, because he knows that Paul's going to talk about the armor of God later on, and our feet have to be fit for the readiness to go out and tell the word. So he gets his jumping shoes on, and what does he do? Does he step out of the boat? No, he jumps out of the boat. And he's walking on water, and all of a sudden he's standing there, he's like, oh, my goodness. But then reality hits. He's a fisherman. He realizes the density of water can't hold him up. And he looks up, and he sees the winds, he sees the waves, he sees the lightning. And we know what happens. Peter sank. And he said, you know what? Lord, save me. And he reached up his arm. And Jesus reached down and saved him. And what's so great about it is I want you to re reach in the uh, pocket in front of you. There's three things in front. Just get one. Just There's little things inside. So everybody reach in the front pocket in front of you. Yeah, there's, there's one in there. It smells good. It's winter green. Yeah. And when you get it, I want you to raise it up high. I want you to raise it up high. Yeah, with passion. Straighten that arm with passion. And what you're going to say is, I have a lifesaver. I have a lifesaver. And if you have two, you don't need to because there's only one Savior and his name's Jesus. So if you have two, put one back and realize you have one lifesaver. And he reaches out your ar his arm and helps you in any storm. See, this story was not about Peter. This story was about Jesus. Peter's passion only happened because he was with the Savior. And what happened when everything calmed was when Jesus got in the boat. Peter could do nothing without Jesus. His passion was connected to Jesus. But when, when Jesus got in the boat, the wind died down. Everything became calm. And then the first thing happened. We had a multiple confession of faith where he said, truly, you are the son of the God, as the disciples said. So the next thing we do after we believe, okay. Oh, boy, Jim, I lose my clicker. Do you see where I put it, Jim? Whew. Next thing we have to do is we have to obey. Now, this is crazy, okay? This is in Matthew 16. This is the first confession of faith, okay? So here's a picture of Caesar Philippi, okay? This is where they were. Now, Caesar Philippi is a border town. It's right between where Israel and the Gentiles were. So in chapter 16, Peter is with the disciples, and they're in Caesar Philippi. Now, that right there where that cave is, that's called the gates of hell. 
And that rock on top of it is a huge rock. It goes up 1,700 feet, and there's a huge rock. But they're in this border town where there's so much heathen faith. In fact, this is the universal law of Pan. And so it's half goat and half man is the God that they worshiped. And so he's going into the Gentile world, and he's sitting there with his disciples, possibly looking upon the gates of hell, which is where the heathen actually threw their children in that water to sacrifice them. They were a heathen culture, border of Israel and the Gentile world. And Jesus talks to his disciples and says, hey, who do you guys say the son of man is? And of course, they're lukewarm. They don't have passion yet. So they say, well, you could be Elijah. You could be John the Baptist. You could be Jeremiah. And then Jesus, just like he does us, he looks us in the eye and he says, no, who do you say I am? And who's the guy that not only jumped out of the boat but made the confession? It's Peter. Peter, Peter with passion says, you're the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know what Jesus says to him? Blessed are you, son of Jonah, for this was not told to you by man, but by the Father in heaven, because he had seen Jesus work. He was starting to obey. And when he started to obey, great things started happening. This is just like our lives. The first confession of faith, we obey, and everything's changed. And you know what he says? He says, basically, that my church will be built upon that rock, calling Peter, who's Petros, Petra, rock, He's going to build his church on this rock, and the gates of hell will not overtake it. It says Hades in your book. But the chances are they were probably looking right at this place in Caesar Philippi, saying, you know what? We're going to attack darkness. We're not going to be afraid of it. We're going to go into the Gentile world. And Peter, we're going to build upon your, upon your confession the church. And then he was given the keys to the kingdom. The keys! Not the keys to the church. The keys to the kingdom, which means the keys to our hearts, so that everything... I'm sorry, I'm spitting apples. That was supposed to happen today. But the keys... And what's so great about that is it's going to move forward because he's taken it into the Gentile world. And you know what happens next? It's the <coughs> apple. <coughs> it's the first time that Jesus gets ready to say, hey, I'm going to die. It's the first time the gospel message comes to fruition. And he tells Peter this right after this moment. And Peter says, no, you can't go. And he says, get away from me, Satan. So his passion caused him to confess. The whole church is built upon that one confession. But then in just a moment, he says, I rebuke you. So we believe, we obey, and now we lead. Now what's happened after this? We're in Acts 2, 14 through 41. You can read all that if you want. It's incredible. I read it every day this week, and it changes every day I read it. It blows me away. It goes through my soul and says, oh my gosh, Peter, you are so stinking awesome. Because in this, it's his first Christian sermon ever. We've had the first man ever walking on the water, Victor. The first man ever walking on water. You know what else? We had the first confession of faith. Now we've got the first Christian sermon. And he goes in front of all the people after the Holy Spirit came up on the church. And he's talking about, for the first time, to all the onlookers, you know what he's talking about? Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, boy, here's what you did. He's talking to all these people, and he's saying, because of you, Jesus was crucified. But God appointed you already, and Jesus already, so he, he was raised from the dead. And then Peter he keeps talking, and in 569 words, 569 words, we hear the first gospel message. And as Peter was talking basically that day, over 3,000 were saved. But the one thing you have to know is this happened because Jesus was gone and the Holy Spirit came. When the Holy Spirit came, Jesus foretold, I have to go because something better is coming. And so 3,000 were saved in that day. At the end of his sermon, this is what he said. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter's message made them ask a question, made them drive for a confession of faith. And what he said is, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of who? Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, you don't understand. Peter sunk when he jumped out of the boat. Peter got rebuked when he was with Jesus because he said, oh, no, you can't leave. But when he received the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, he's more, more passion than he's ever had. The Holy Spirit had to come up on him to get that. And that's when he started to lead, the first Christian sermon. So we believe, we obey, we lead, and we defend. Whew. I know a lot of you don't know this, but I'm, I'm a defensive guy, obviously, and I love defensive football, basketball, whatever it is, because I understand that these feet fitted with a the readiness. There's sometimes you just have to take a stand. And you have to say, you know what, I'm going to take a bullet for whatever. I'm going to, there's something bigger in life that I'm willing to sacrifice for. And that's where passion comes from. But what Peter does right here, you have to understand, is we're in Acts 4. 
He's just healed a beggar in Jesus' name. He's just healed somebody because of the Holy Spirit. Now, for you, you're thinking, man, that's pretty exciting, but we can't really think about this because, you know, he later healed with his shadow because Jesus was living inside him and the Holy Spirit came. But he's standing in front of the Sanhedrin because they came out and heard them preaching. How did you heal somebody? And they basically put him in jail. Now, who's the Sanhedrin? The same people that crucified Jesus. The same exact people that crucified Jesus. And Peter stands in front of them in, verse, in chapter 4 of Acts, verse 8. And he says, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. He looks the people that crucified Jesus in the eye. And he said, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind in which we must be saved. That is passion. That is Peter's walk because he believed in something bigger than himself and he followed Jesus. Then he obeyed and his small acts of obedience led to large acts of faith. Then he led. He went out and preached the word. Then he defended. There's no way I could do that not even close to as passionate as Peter, not even close to as passionate as our veterans, the people that would willingly sacrifice for our freedom. You see, passion, we think it's a personality trait, but when you believe and you obey and you lead and you defend and you put them all together, you're bold. And that's what Peter was. He was bold. And you know what? Boldness is not a personality trait. It's a conviction. And the depth of your conviction will equal the height of your passion. It's that simple. So don't say, you know what? That's not my personality. When you believe in Jesus or when you believe in something bigger than yourself and the spirit comes down upon you, you're going to be able to do things you never thought possible. But it goes back to this. I'm not a cheese grater. I'm not a cheese grater. I'm not an apple slicer. No, you're perfect the way God created you, something that nobody's ever done. In fact, you're going to walk in heaven hopefully someday and Moses is going to come up to you and say, man, I wish I had the Holy Spirit. I didn't have it when I was walking the earth. Whew. Being bold is not... A personality trait. It's a conviction in something bigger than ourselves. So as you go on to the end of this, okay? Right after this, we're going to end with this prayer. By the believers in Acts 4.29, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After, the pl after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken shaken and they were all filled with the holy spirit and spoke the word of god boldly man i want that passion i want that fire i want that revival but passion is not just something that comes without a deep belief and an obedience but here's what you understand that we don't get we want it to be about our story peter didn't want to be the superstar of his own story he wanted to be a character in God's story. And that's exactly what I want because I don't know when my story is going to end, but I know God's goes on forever. And if you want to find out what passion is, find out why you were created, what purpose you're given. Give it away and you'll find a passion like you've never seen because every single person sitting here today was meant for something special. Woo! Right there. So I'm going to ask you to go bold. I'm going to ask you to do something. And this is crazy. See, at youth on every Wednesday night, I've tried to get a response because it's not about what we talk about. It's about who we are and what we do with what we know. And so each week we sing a song and they come up to the front and I say, don't come unless you're committed. Don't come unless you're willing to do it. And see this card right here? It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And they walk up front here like this and they grab a card and they go back to their seat or they may pray. 
But when they go back to their seat, it's awesome because I know they take it with them and I see them throughout the week and I see pictures. You can put it in your car, you can put it on your mirror, but it reminds you that I, to be bold, I either am believing, obeying, leading, or defending. So when we sing the song that we're getting ready to sing, I dare you to be bold enough to come up and grab one. Dare you. Now, no pressure, but every single youth does. Every single one of them comes up front. Now, I know you're probably not as passionate as bold as our youth, right? No, you are, because you're children of God. So I'm gonna put a pile right here. Okay, and if only one comes up, great. And I'm gonna put a pile right over here. And only one comes up, it's over, great. But revival is when everybody comes. <sighs> now, here's what I'm gonna end with. Everybody in this room is in one of those four places. You wanna believe in Jesus, but you haven't accepted and jumped out of the boat yet. You haven't quite given him your life. Or you have given him your life, but you're afraid to obey. The small things he asks you to do every day, you're not willing to do yet. Or you may obey and you're starting to do it, but you know what? You're sitting right there on the sidelines saying, you know what? God's called me to lead, but I haven't quite gone to, to Jim or Steve or Steve Bear or let a Sunday school class or done whatever it is you're called to do and you haven't led yet. Or maybe some of you are leading, but boy, you haven't defended to the point where you know what? Boy, this word of God's important. I need to take it out boldly into the world. So I know that everybody in here, including me, is in one of these spots. So I'm going to be the first to grab a card. But we're going to sing a song right now. And Jim and I, making Jim on the spot. Jim and I are going to grab a card, right, Jim? Yes. So we're going to sing a song. And if you want to come up and pick a card up, and you want to say a prayer, you need somebody to pray with you, let's do it. I'm going to pray for you before we do, and then Brad's going to come up and sing a song. Father God, we thank you for this awesome day. We thank you that everybody's in here today. We just know that there was a divine meeting caused just for today, that we might take this card and we may see it three weeks from now. And it may remind me, may remind us, I was designed for something special. I'm having a hard day and I know that whatever I do, I'm gonna work at it because God's depending on me. And I was created as a cheese grater, an apple slicer. Heck, I might even be a food processor. But I'm gonna do the best I can with what I've been given. Lord, we know you love us. We praise you and we thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody in the building said, let's stand because we're going to sing. Y'all know I'm a little crazy, right? So we're going to kind of have a different kind of calling out unless Jim wants to change it. Jim, you're more than welcome to come up here. I just got to tell you, I'm just so thankful. I can't tell you how excited I am that they gave me keys. Woo! Woo! Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. But you know what? We're going to put your hands in the air real high. And I'm going to say one, two, three, and we're going to say Jesus as loud as we can so they can hear us in Columbus. Are you ready? Jesus on three. One, two, three. Jesus. Have a blessed day. Thanks for coming to church.